Welcome to the main stage for our next panel. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you a bunch of fans of this game that we all love who have got stuck into one of the greatest ways to play Magic, and that is, of course, cubing. Cubing, and look, we've got some cube fans here ready to get stuck into our next panel. I'm not going to keep them from you one moment longer than necessary. So please join me in welcoming the host of this panel here. It's Andy Mangold. to be taking care of things from here. Mount, please welcome Andy to the stage. Good afternoon, MagicCon. We are so excited to speak to you today about Cube, which is, I believe, the greatest way to play Magic. And I'm hoping to make that case to all of you today. So without any further ado, let's welcome our esteemed panelists. Give it up. Come on, esteemed panelists. <laughs> All right, so I'll introduce everybody. Uh, sitting here to my left, we have the host of the Lucky Paper Radio podcast and the developer behind a suite of web-based tools, all to save Magic players from doing repetitive tasks. This is Anthony Maddox. Thanks, Andy. Great to be here. And the man that needs no introduction. You know him from the Commander vs. YouTube series on YouTube and also the dearly departed Cube podcast, The 540. He's one of the organizers of KubeCon, the first and hopefully uh, ongoing competitive magic event dedicated to Cube in Madison, Wisconsin. He's also our resident Cube old head. It's Justin Parnell. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have a Cube enthusiast and journalist who just published an extensive and thoroughly researched history of the format. He's also a contributor to a host of Cube content properties, including Lucky Paper and the Cultic Cube YouTube channels. It's Parker Lamascus. Hey. Thanks for having me. And finally, the developer behind Cube Cobra, the prevailing website for designing and sharing cubes, and another one of the organizers of KubeCon, the patron saint of the cube community to which we are all indebted, it's Gwen Decker. <laughs> I just want to get a sense of the audience. So just by, uh, by, by woos, who here has heard of Cube? <laughs> That's a lot of woos. Who here has played a cube? Same amount of woos. <laughs> Who here has played a cube not on Magic Online or Arena? Woo! Same amount of woos. woos. Finally, who here has a cube of their own? Woo! Okay, so everybody is just really into this <laughs> format. Turns out when you say that the panel is about cube, all the cube fans show up. So uh, we are starting with first principles, even though you all seem to know what's going on here. I'm going to ask Anthony, what is a cube? So Cube at its most basic, its most fundamental, is just a custom draft format. So if you're used to doing a booster draft where you crack open a bunch of packs and draft with your friends, it's the same thing, but somebody else curates the environment and puts together their favorite cards that you draft from. Uh, but it's super flexible. Beyond that, people play cubes in all kinds of different ways based on just what cards they include. Uh, but really, it's, it's such a flexible format because unlike a lot of other casual formats that you need a whole group of people to all sort of buy in at once, one cube curator can come and sort of set the scene for the whole group and say, you know, here's the new band list. These are the cards we're playing with. Or we want to change the pack size or add custom rules or do whatever we want beyond that. And it just takes the buy-in of the cube designer and their seven players or whatever. Uh, so it's just a super flexible, open-ended format. What, one of my favorite things about Cube is it's a shared experience mm -hmm. with everyone. And it's a shared experience that's not you know, it's, it's unlike Retail Limited, where it's similar in the same way, but a person is taking all of the cards that they love and all the things they love about Magic and putting them in a box and saying, this is what I want everyone to experience. Everyone gets to have that together. And I just, that's my favorite thing about Cube. I want to throw to, well, so first, actually, you know, Cube designers will always take an opportunity to do a pack one, pick one. So I want to ask our panelists here. We've got a pack on screen from Caleb Gannon's Powered Synergy Cube, which uh, came to Magic Online to great fanfare last year. So I'm just going to go down the line here and ask everybody what they're taking pack one, pick one. Anthony? OK, so I saw this pack earlier, but I didn't know the context. And context is so important to Cube because all these cards are going to play differently depending on where they are. Uh, and when I was looking at this earlier, I see uh, Telerian Academy. It's an extremely powerful card. And I also see a ton of artifacts here. So even though there are a bunch of other powerful things here, that's where I want to start. And I've been playing a lot of artifact-themed decks this weekend, so <laughs> I'm maybe a little bit biased by that, too. Parnell. All right. <laughs> so. I'm going to disagree with time. Anthony a bit. That's fine. And not just on the pick, <laughs> although I'll get there. Uh, sometimes you open a pack, and you don't have to think, oh, what is the context of this? You're just like, this is my uh -huh. favorite magic card. <laughs> oh, see, I don't see. care what's happening with the rest of this cube. This is the one that I want. 
And there's a card in this pack that was the very first card I ever drafted in a cube draft. And that's Yawgmoss Well, and that's what I'm going to take. You would think we planned this, but I didn't. I didn't know that, so great. The first pick I ever <laughs> picked in a cube draft back in 2008. All right. Yawgmoss Well. Parker, how about you? Okay, so I see a lot of artifacts, and the first thing I think is um, I want to win against the artifact deck. And I love playing red-black, so that puts me on Kolagon's command. All right. I'm hate on all those beat. artifacts. Easy. I was going to try, right. try to wheel that with my Yogma Swill. <laughs> wheel. I've also experienced a lot of that this weekend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Gwen, finally, what are you taking out of this pack? Well, my favorite uh, deck to play in this kind of cube is just like mono brown artifacts. Um, so the Tularan Academy is interesting because that, that operates on that axis. But I think I'm just on the Mana Vault here. I, I think it just lets you ramp out you know, some broken thing on turn two or three, and that's usually just good enough. Four different answers, so three of you must be wrong. Again, with our patented True. Who meter, who agrees with Anthony? Who's taking Tularian Academy? <laughs> All right, we got All this right. zone over here. And who shares Justin's affection for Yawgmoth's will? Oh, one, <laughs> one very enthusiastic person. But very excited, I appreciate you. Parker, who's starting on, uh, on K-Command with Parker here? All right, I made the wrong choice, evidently. And finally, who's taking the Mana Vault? Yeah! Ooh, okay. Well, wow, Gwen, wow. you're obviously objectively correct. We're also grateful that magic is something where you can find the objective correct answer. And so uh, you win, Gwen. Good job. I want to talk about how we got to where we are today. So, uh, Parker, as I mentioned in your introduction, you recently completed a, well, completed is a hard thing to say. You recently published a very thorough history of the cube format. And you know, cube is a small magic format in a relatively small hobby that we all share. And it's the kind of thing that oftentimes just doesn't get documented. And a lot of these stories and history is lost to time. So, Andy, small, small hobby? I mean, OK, we're, <laughs> we're at a big venue for the small hobby. But you know, <laughs> relative to other things, can you just talk to us about how Cube began? Yeah, so magic itself is quite old. Uh, it's been around since 1993. And um, Cube was not an immediate invention. I mean, there wasn't even draft in the beginning of magic. Um, but when, by the time draft starts to roll around in the late 90s, there are um, enterprising magic players. I was not playing at that time, but some people. You were about four years old, right? Yeah, I was about four. <laughs> um, some people did own a collection of every magic card, and they would start doing something called a big box draft, where they would take all of magic and make packs out of it and draft um, from among all of magic's history. Of course. There were much fewer magic cards at that time. And as more and more cards were printed, it would become um, unwieldy to own every magic card, shuffle that pile, and then deal out a draft. And so that's when you get people starting to curate the cards that they pick out of magic. Um, and over years and years of that kind of innovation, we eventually get to magic coming from a homebrew, very um, grassroots kind of format to the 2007 Magic Invitational. And that was the first big spotlight that Cube got um, and its biggest recognition from Wizards and the biggest platform for it. I hear this question a lot. What is the history of the name Cube? Why is it called Cube? You're the, you're the person to ask. Yeah, so uh, a geometric cube has six faces of equal size in the same way. Math checks out. Math checks out. Yep. In the same way, a Magic Cube has six faces of equal size. And you may be thinking, but there's only five colors in magic. How could there be equal sizes of five colored sections? Well, the sixth section is lands, artifacts, and gold cards. Mm -hmm. So the original cube curators were like, this is a cube. We've got six equal sections, kind of seven or eight sections, <laughs> um, but it was good enough. And that symmetry and that catchy hook of six equal faces of the best cards in magic that's what enabled it to spread and spread easily. You could just say, here's a cube, here's a very short pitch, and it's immediately compelling. We all got the a, power, uh, every, all the cool a little pack here magic from, uh, in here. Now, from the, the kind of stuff Invitational like in 2007, Especially which I think says a lot about where cube was at. Somebody might open up when they play this format. Strong he's start. He's just, he's just touching that Library of Alexandria. Rectum Look at him go. Age. No sleeves. Battle Screech. So far, I'm on Battle Screen. Disenchant. <laughs> obviously. Savannah Lion. Nimble Mongoose. 
Garrick Wildspeaker, Oath of Druids, Mock Sapphire, Wolf <laughs> Draw. How are you feeling? A groan from the audience at the sight of the sapphire. <laughs> Goblin Welder, Ancient Hydra, oh boy. The Abyss, and Imperial Seal. And I promise you, we're not going to talk the Orphics from that pack. That would take too long. Pack. But I think it gives you a sense of what 2007 was like. You know, so often we hear these numbers, but that's what Magic was like back then. That was what the Invitational Cube Draft was. Justin, I know you started playing around this time, around the time of the Invitational. Can you talk about how you got into Cube? I did. So the very first time that, that I Cube drafted, I've been playing Magic all since the power, the 1999, which is why I'm the I'm the past in the future past and present of Cube. So uh, I was at a double PTQ weekend in 2008. PTQ Pro Tour qualifier. The system is like kind of like that now, but then it wasn't, then it is. Anyway, a tournament that would qualify you for the Pro Tour. And in between rounds, everyone would be playing various games. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd play your decks against each other. Maybe you'd, you'd play some limited. And I had not heard of Cube, despite the Invitational really happening. I guess I just wasn't paying attention up until that point. Uh, and my friend, Kenny Mayer, asked me, he's like, hey, do you want to come cube with me? And I'm like, I have no idea what cube is. This is just a nonsense term yes. to say to someone with, that is, is a, you know. Would you like to come over to my house and sphere? Exactly, just yes. a shape. So, and I'm just like, what is it? He's like, don't, it's fine, just come on. And, he just, and he's just like, come on. And he kind of gestures me over. There's seven other people sitting down. I'm the eighth person. And I sit down at this table. I see that there's sleeved cards of magic. And I open the first pack, and it's uh, the three cards that I remember are Cloud Goat Ranger, Mind Over Matter, and Yogg Will, which I noted I took Yogg Will. And I'm looking at this pack, and I'm like, this is the greatest thing I've ever done in magic in my <laughs> life. <laughs> I was hooked from that moment. I, I didn't even finish the experience. draft. I remember the experience of opening your first cube pack and yeah. being like, oh. I am in love with every card in this pack. This is a dream. I think a lot of people have that experience with Cube, especially. And, and, and I very much appreciate Magic Online and Magic Arena and being able to take Cube to such a wider audience. Uh, but man, there's, there's nothing like opening your first Cube pack and holding the cards in your hand. It's just an amazing experience. And, and from there, I was completely hooked. Over the next 12 months, I, I built my own personal cube around the time that Conflux came out in 2008. That's when, uh, or 2000, early 2009, because this was early 2008. So early 2009 is when I built my first cube. And then it's, here I am, all the way from there. And it's been a, quite a journey of cubing for, oh my god, 15 years? That's a really long time. I oh, actually man. hadn't done the math until this very second. I feel very, very old. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, it, I could not have imagined this tiny, tiny, tiny portion of magic that we would be here at MagicCon, 30th anniversary of magic, and this is something that so many people care about. And it's just amazing uh, that how far this format has come, and in my opinion, how far we're still able to go. I think one of the stories I want to talk about today is kind of the arc of what cubes are and can be. And I think it's safe to say, and maybe you can verify this or refute it, Justin, that in the early days of cube, it was really about putting what people perceived to be the most powerful magic cards in a box and drafting them. The idea yeah. of designing a cube was the same as designing a deck, right? You take bad cards out, you put good cards in. Yes. So it was, I remember uh, when Lorwyn was still very new when I first cubed, right? It was such a big deal that you had like cards like Knight of Meadowgrain as like, oh, this is the, one of the best two drops of all time for cube. Now, Knight of, you probably haven't seen Knight of Meadowgrain in a cube in quite some time. Most people, most people have not. I think time has passed that one by. But you, you had to take what you had uh, because one, cards came out at a much slower rate, and two, they were not quite as powerful. We hadn't reached uh, kind of the apex of design from a power level perspective in Magic, but we were kind of getting over that hump then. So over the next five years from that point, so probably 2008 to 2013, uh, there was a, a, an ability to choose cards rather than just taking the best cards in Magic. Because that's what Cube was. That's what I understood Cube to be, was all of the best cards in Magic. And that's kind of how it was like told to me Like after I talked to people about the draft. These are all the best cards in Magic. We put them all in a box, and we sleeved them up, and there you go. 
And as Parker described, I mean, that's such a powerful selling point. Like, if yeah. you can get somebody to sit down and play your format to say, let's just draft the best cards there are rather than all this chaff, that's extremely compelling, and it, it makes sense why that caught on. And it's not a coincidence, I, I would guess, that your first experience with a cube was at a competitive event. Um, yes. Because the most invested players for that early period of Magic were competitive, mm -hmm. and they were... I, my understanding is the only people um, invested enough to actually own complete collections of cards. Yes, I mean, well, we are, it's just crazy to think about where we are now as a Magic culture. Back then, and when I first started playing Magic, there weren't like these large different groups of Magic players. Now we have people that, you know, I play Modern, I play Commander. You're just a Magic player. Yeah. Like, the, <laughs> you, you, you played the format that was on the PTQ circuit. Uh, sometimes you you played casually, but it was just with all of those things. So Cube, for me, really came out of all of these competitive players that I played with for years. I only played Cube with competitive players because right. that's that's just, those were the people that I was around because those were the people that were the most invested in Magic, exactly what you right. said. It, in some ways, Cube began as the competitive player's kitchen table Magic. Yeah. yeah. And that's really what it was for me. We played in between rounds at a PTQ. Yeah. 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 I think it's easy to take for granted, too. I mean, Magic's been growing so quickly over the past few years. There's a lot of new players. There was a time when, if you were a serious Magic player, you were only playing competitively, right? There was mm -hmm. not Commander where you can get incredibly invested in this hobby. You can have a bunch of Commander decks. You can play casually at a very high level of investment. That just didn't really exist. And I think that's part of why we've seen Magic grow so much, is not everybody wants to be a tournament grinder, but they still want to get really into this hobby. Yeah. Gwen, in chronological order, you're the next person that found Cube on this panel. How did you get introduced to the format? Yeah, that's right. So um, I started playing Magic um, around like the Lara block, and that was like my penny sleeve era, you know, playing on the living room floor. And I just drafted F and M, you know, regularly. And eventually, uh, someone just invited me to Cube, and hooked immediately. Uh, it became like a regular thing. Just after F and M, we just rotated over to Denny's and just did some cube drafts and ate some really not great food. But you know, that, <laughs> that, that hey. was like the dream. Careful, um, we're sponsored by Denny's. We're not. <laughs> um, this yeah, was no. right before, I think, a big moment for Cube, which was Cube coming to Magic Online for the first time in mm -hmm. 2012. I think you said you remember that moment, actually. Yeah, that's right, because um, like back then, the cube we'd always draft is like this vintage powered uh, cube. It was 720, so super high variance. Especially when you think of like back then, the the difference between like the best and the worst card in vintage cube was a lot greater. Mm -hmm. And with such a big um, card pool, you know, the the games are much different than what they look like today. And then Magic Online uh, introduced uh, their vintage cube, and that was that was a really big deal. Uh, I remember a lot of people were really excited about it, um, and. That, that looked very similar to, to the cube uh, that we drafted. And so I think, you know, a lot of time we just got a bunch of players behind a computer and we just, you know, all played, you know, behind one screen. Uh, it was a great time. I, I've sometimes likened paper cube play to like Dungeons and Dragons where you need like one really invested person who's like, I'm going to get 600 sleeves and sleeve up mm. all these cards and play. And if you don't have that person, even if you want to play cube, it's kind of hard to get involved. And Magic Online changed all of that, right? You just needed a computer with internet connection and you could play Cube. Yeah. From there, uh, we shortly after see the launch of Cube Tutor, which I think is probably the watershed moment for Cube design. Not Cube play necessarily, but Cube design, because it was really the first time in any meaningful way that Cube designers could share their Cube designs with the world and see other Cubes that people curate. Can you talk a little bit, Gwen, about the place Cube Tutor has in the history of this community? Yeah, um, I mean, anyone who's designed a cube knows Cube Tutor, basically. Um, uh, it was designed by Ben, uh, who's really reclusive, but you know, we owe a lot to, to Ben. Um, mm -hmm. he, he's, it's a labor of love, and he's done a lot for the community. And when Cube Tutor started coming out, um, people were just sharing lists. And I think this is the moment where you began to see cubes other than like just the most powerful cards in Magic. And that's really when people start to get creative and, and look at Cube more as like a board game where they can actually cultivate you know, whatever type of game that they want uh, with the cards they have access to. Um, yeah, thank you, Ben. We, we, really, <laughs> we really owe a lot to you. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's really easy to understate the importance of these tools, because unlike every other format of Magic, where the focus is the deck, and we have all these tools that allow us to share decks and talk about decks. We have all these language that allows us to talk about it. Um, but talking about an entire format and the way that you approach it and the way it splits into multiple decks and the way you navigate it, we really needed those custom tools to be able to simulate drafts and look at the mana curve and things like that just to be able to have a way to communicate and think about uh, a cube in that way. I mean, I, I will say as someone who... Um some of you probably know I love my Excel spreadsheets. I still have my, my cube on, on a, a Excel spreadsheet. So, yes, Excel. <laughs> lovers. Uh, yeah, there Brought we go. Brought to you by Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it was, it, I actually took a little while to warm up to the idea of not using a spreadsheet to house my cube. And when I say warm up, I mean I still have it on an Excel <laughs> cube uh, document right now. But um, being able to look at, just look at a cube in the way that you would in a real life scenario mm -hmm. is a crazy change in the dynamic. I mean, just, uh, it really cannot be understated. And this was 10 years ago, and it seems very obvious right now because we have all of these tools as a magic community to put a deck list on a website and look at it or a, a collection on a website and look at it and just see it in kind of real time where you're actually looking at the cards, right? And that's, that's just something that didn't exist for Cube at all. And it's, it's crazy to think like that this is truly, and Gwyn is not underselling it at all, that this is, this is like a, a monumental thing for our community that this existed. Anthony, you were the next person on, on this panel to start playing Cube, and you didn't play Cube prior to the existence of these tools. The Cube world you know is the world of Cube Tutor and now Cube Cobra. Yep. How did you get introduced to the format? So my getting into Cube was through a couple steps, very much directly from Magic Online, actually from Luis Scott Vargas playing, putting up uh, YouTube videos, to you watching them, to you creating yeah. a tube, so, uh, your own cube that I started playing. So that was sort of my first introduction. My context, I think, was, was important, though, that I sort of started with Kitchen Table, played a ton of Commander, then kind of wanted something that was a little more competitive, where I could actually focus on growing my skills as a player. And then Cube kind of formed this sort of conflux of the two things that I really loved about Magic, where I wanted to be able to play with these cards that uh, didn't necessarily work in competitive contexts, but I also wanted to play in an optimal way. I didn't necessarily want to sit down to a commander table and say, I'm just going to you know, opt into playing at a lower power level. And you know, you have this sort of social contract, which works if you have a group of players. They're all on the same page. Uh, but for me, just saying, oh, I can just make my custom draft format. I can put all the cards that I love here. And then we can all try and win. We can all tr like, you know, really try and optimize it and figure out how to solve this new puzzle from this new set of cards, which is really compelling. So that's sort of how I approached the format was, let's make it our custom, custom limited format. And then Parker, you are the, the most recent person on this stage to, uh, to adopt Cube as your format of choice. What was your introduction to the format? Yeah, so I was in college and somebody shared a Cube with me. And this is, um, I think, if, if the Magic Online Vintage Cube is like what most people think of the first time they think of Cube, the second Cube they think of is just a shoebox of cards that somebody puts together and that's their first Cube. And that's exactly what this was. And it was, in some ways, an amazing experience. There were other things I wasn't crazy about in that gameplay. Um, yeah, I lost some <laughs> heartbreaking games. I still remember them. Um, and so I created my own cube, <laughs> partly as a control freak, as a way to say, I'm not going to lose any more games like that. We're I'm not going to have this card in the cube anymore. Right. I'm I gonna, lost to this. We're cutting it. I'm going to have this I'm experience. I'm making my format, and I'm banning that card. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> On my own terms. And so that's how I got started. Yeah, I mean, that was such a compelling aspect of the format to me was, as a cube curator, I could both you know, opt into these lower powered cards and still try and play them in an optimal way. I could also just exclude the cards that I didn't really enjoy playing with. Uh, so it sort of works on both axes of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then in 2018, we see the first examples of cubes being brought to Magic Online that were not the Magic Online vintage legacy or modern cubes. It was part of the Community Spotlight series. So here's where we saw the introduction of Carmen Handy's Proliferate Cube, or David McDarby's Live the Dream Cube, or eventually Caleb Gannon's Cube. David in the front row there. Uh, I think this is a big moment for Cube as well, because this is, yeah. again, on that biggest platform that Cube has, Magic yep. Online, we now see other examples of what this format can be that is not just you know, some variation of power maxing within a certain restriction. Mm. I think that for, before we move on, before 2018, when, when that was uh, 
introduced as the, the Spotlight series from an individual cube design standpoint for each of those cubes, if you ask someone what a cube was, you're going to get the same answer 95 times out of 100, right? That was the time where it actually said, cube can actually be all of these different things. And it really opened people's minds to the creativity that you can put into creating a truly custom draft in Myra and not just all the best cards, like you said, just you know, adjusting the power level. But that is, that's eye-opening for people that have played one cube, the Magic Online cube, or just their friend's cube. That's what cube is to them, right? And until you see all of these other cubes, especially if you're not a cube owner, and I mean, just realistically, how, how many more cube players are there than cube owners? Like, obviously, p the people here are the most invested. You all, most of you own cubes, and this is something that is very close to you. But the number of people that are playing cubes outweighs the number of owners by a... Hopefully about 7 to 1. Ideally, at, at least, <laughs> at least yeah. 7 Ideally to 1. Ideally about 7 to 1. Uh, so this is a good segue, actually. So you are also part of organizing the uh, big cube event at SCG Con for two years there and running that event, designing the cubes. This was really, I think, one of the first times we saw cube played at a high competitive level and for real stakes. Yeah. What was it like running that event? Stressful for me. <laughs> uh, that was, I mean, that was a passion project that... Um, for, I was very fortunate that uh, during my time, my, my 10 years working at Star City Games, uh, that a lot of that I was able to kind of sell my passion to other people for that and get a lot of people on board for this, cr frankly, crazy idea of, of running a cube draft where you have qualifiers during the, the uh, Friday, Saturday, and I think maybe we did Sunday, to having a large event on Sunday evening with a huge monetary prize in a, a custom draft format. That's, I mean, a it format that nobody has min max, nobody has, you know, ground out 100 drafts of it because they can't. It's, this is the yeah. one place you get to play this cube, so. We did have one of the testers make top eight. <laughs> okay, well, you know. Yeah, Jake Humphreys, he did make top eight that first year. Uh, yeah, but uh, putting, putting that together, that was several months of, <laughs> the first one I was gonna say several months, and only one, one set came out during the time that I was testing. It didn't change a whole lot. Um, I, it's like forgotten in time. Some of you might have heard of Throne of Eldraine, a lot of really low oh, power yeah. cards. Didn't yeah. change much of anything. So during the time that we were testing, that came out. And, uh, and really putting that together and putting it through its paces to try to make an environment that served a lot of things. One, to be in engaging to play one time, because this is, this is something that is, that is set up for people to play in isolation. And then, you know, if people want to make the cube on their own, they can do that. But uh, to be able to play one time, to be able to make an engaging uh, you know, view for the, the audience, the online audience of something to watch and uh, something to pull people in that maybe they watched our coverage of the SCG Invitational all weekend and then, uh oh, Sunday, guess what? Cube is happening. Well, you just watched the Invitational of like 1v1 Magic, you know, right. in modern and standard. Well, maybe I'll stick around and see what Cube's about. And it was, I felt like it was my job to try to hook people and get, I mean, my whole deal has been getting people addicted to cube drafting the whole time that I've been making content, right? Like, that's, that's really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So that was another platform for me to show people cube real cards in their hand, have, have you know, someone opens a pack of power, and they're like, whoa, that is crazy. How can I do that? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, serving, serving a, lot of different, uh, a lot of different needs, in my opinion, for that event. So it was, uh, a lot went into it to make sure those were met, but I, you know, I'm thrilled that we were able to do it, not once, but twice. And for that second um, SCG con, mm -hmm. tell me about the Players Cube. Didn't you have a <laughs> collaborative design process for that? Yes-ish. Yes. So that was, uh, that was something that I was very, very difficult. Um, I, along with the uh, marketing assistant manager, Jenna Julefs at Star City Games, we put together this concept of saying, what if we let people vote on a cube to build that they would play to qualify for that top eight draft? Yeah. Which we called the player's cube. And uh, as, as cube designers know, if you are letting people just vote on the cards that are going to be in your cube, you should expect absolute chaos. And chaos is good to a degree, but I want it to be controlled chaos. So I kind of did, you know, like two-thirds of the work and was like, these two-thirds of the cards are in, and they'll vote on the other third. Yeah. So I had to, I went through and, 
and basically put car light cards into buckets, is what I called them, and then people voted on those on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, and they designed the rest of the cube. Now, I, I you know I narrowed it down a little bit, but I you know let it ride. Yeah, that's whatever they picked. And to me, that's like a major narrative thread over the past um, decades of cube development is like breaking down these fundamental assumptions of what cube is because in the early days assuming I like I'm assuming it was one person's idea we know that the first cube um, was in the Toronto area playgroup back in the 90s um, it was the playgroup of Gabe Tsang and Brett Allen um, Tsang would go on to win the 2005 Pro Tour along with Gabe Nassif and uh, David Rood but um, it was like one idea one designer one cube and you know, the player's cube violates that fundamental assumption that yeah. cube has to be one person's doing. And that's one example of a broken assumption, but I think um, we're seeing cube designers more and more find more assumptions to break and more creativity to unlock in doing that. Well, I, I can tell you as a cube designer, it was difficult in times for me because obviously I'm, we're, we're creating this scenario where people can vote. I obviously have a vote. It did not go the way that I wanted it to a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like trying to put together this custom environment. I'm like, I really hope they don't vote for Delver of Secrets because it doesn't work very well. Delver of Secrets yeah. easily won. Yeah. Um, Just at employing the famous great design principle designed by committee that we all know to work fantastic. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah, for everything all across life. That brings us to 2019 where we see, Gwen, you launched Cube Cobra, which is the heir apparent to Cube Tutor. Why did you decide to take on the thankless job of developing and maintaining a website for this community? That's a good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> yeah, so around this time, um, there, there was a need for something. Basically, Cube Tutor was in a rough spot. Um, they were kind of dealing with it, like internal uh, tech issues where they couldn't update the site anymore. And it had been in a state like that for about a year. Um, and as a you know active user of Cube Tutor, uh, it was really frustrating for me, and I thought, why not just you know do it myself? Um, so I can think of some reasons why not, but yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you didn't. <laughs> uh, initially, I just like I took it from the perspective of I want to build a tool for myself. It wasn't even a website when I first built it. It was just a little program, and eventually um, I just showed it to some people, and they thought it was really cool. So I made it a website instead. Um, and um, a lot of the, the things I did differently is uh, it's open source. Um, it's, it's not just like a passion project for me, but it's a, a community-driven um, project. You have a lo lot of people contributing to make this site what it is. Um, and I think really quickly, we saw a lot of people move over, and it kind of became like the de facto cube website. Uh, which and I know it took a lot of pressure off of Ben, frankly. Uh, from talking to him, I know it was like he was the one thing. This was the one place everyone was mm -hmm. doing their cube man management, and the technical debt was piling up. It was getting harder and harder to actually maintain the site, and that's exactly. stressful. Yeah. Yeah, now, now yeah, I. Yeah, I was about to, to say, now it's on you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, I've been actively maintaining it uh, for, you know, ever, ever since. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is a thankless job because. Um, the bugs just, you know, every time I fix a bug, two more pop up, and that's just kind of the nature of, of software development. Um, and I, I'm really, you know, just working as hard as I can to make it, you know, the best cube website uh, possible. So I'll, I'll take a yeah. moment here. I do want to want to plug the Cube Cobra Patreon. Uh, if you value this community and you want this to continue to exist, consider becoming a supporter of. Again, the uh, incredible amount of work it goes into maintaining uh, a site like this and hosting it. Yeah, I, I would also like to note that uh, Gwen will undersell their ability and how incredibly difficult what they've done is. Um, having worked with Gwen on other projects, uh, I can I can tell you that the amount of effort that went in and continually goes into Cube Cobra as well as other things associated with that is immense. Absolutely immense. So, uh, I All right, we get it. Gwen's yeah, cool. Uh, Let's move on. So uh, this year, one more, one more. another round of applause for Gwen. 
Uh, and then this past year, 2022, we uh, saw 200 plus people gather in Madison, Wisconsin for an entire event dedicated just to Cube Draft. Uh, Justin and Gwen were on the organizing team for this event. Can you talk about how this event came to be? Yes. So, uh, conveniently, this, the concept of this event actually came directly off of the uh, 2019 SCG Con uh, 10K draft that Jonathan Brostoff won. And, yeah, he does uh, and a lot of people know Jay Bro. You know, yeah, shout out. Uh, he, big cuber on Magic Online, uh, loves cube. Maybe no person that I've ever met that has a greater pure, unbridled passion for the format of cube than Jay Bro. And I mean that He's in just a, a ball scary of way. For everything in yeah. life. Yes. So, uh, you know, I was I was doing commentary for that event, and uh, we did I did a winners interview with Jay Bro after he won, and after that he's like, man, wouldn't it be crazy if like we just had a whole convention of this? And I was like, yeah, it'd be crazy. And then we kind of just went our separate ways, <laughs> and then I had him on my podcast a little uh, a, like a like the next month, a couple of weeks later, and afterwards we talked, and he was like. Wouldn't it like really be crazy? Like if we like if it actually happened? Like the good kind of crazy? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he is a very persistent person. Um, <laughs> and he was just like, you know, this would, you know, you, you could you could just get we could get all these people together just to play cube. The whole thing, the whole convention is just cube. And from there, um, he put a lot of different people together. I think we have a organizing committee of uh, eight people. Is that right? Approximately. Uh, that all come from different areas of expertise in magic. And over the course of, of time, initially this event was actually supposed to happen in uh, 2020. Hmm. And I don't know if you guys remember the world then. It was supposed to happen in May of 2020. That did not happen. It was actually for the best. I think that was actually, uh, and this is crazy to say, but um, that event wouldn't have been what the one that we did last year in 2022 happened. Um, and overall, we're able to, th this group of eight people um, was able to, to put together an event that did exactly what Jay Bro's initial vision was, was to have a convention of just Cube. There's not anything else going on. Um, very, very few other formats were even played for four days other than Cube, which is just crazy to me. I mean, it's beautiful. That's, that's actually what I've been doing. I've only cubed here this weekend. Right before I came up to this panel, I was cubing, and I'm going to go do the same thing afterwards. Um, and it's worth noting, dozens of completely different, unique cubes were on yes. offer as part of just the official sanctioned KubeCon tournaments, and also everyone else brought other cubes. It was also, I think, a great highlight of the diversity of what this format is now. And it truly is uh, the passion that everyone had, the fact that, that this was able to come together. I've never, and I've been a part of a lot of events, both as an attendee of being playing Magic for almost 25 years, as an organizer. Um, I've, I've never experienced an event where everyone was so happy to be there. Yeah. Every single person. It was absolutely incredible. Um, and it's something that we hope to do. But we will do, not hope to do. KubeCon Q, Q 2023 is happening. Yes. Again, in Madison, Wisconsin yes, this October. Yes, for that. Um, all of you should be there. It's if true. you are having fun at this event and you love Cube and you've cubed there, if you've cubed here, please make an effort uh, because we want this to continue and this to grow into a thing. Because uh, all of the people that are a part of this, from an organizational standpoint, we love this format with all of our heart, and it means so much to us. We want this to be successful because we love Cube, and uh, the first one was. And I think that we are just we're thankful that that all of the people that contributed did so. For, for spending their time, offering their cubes, um, and just sharing their joy in the way that we did. So that brings us more or less to today. And much like a lot of other fan organized formats like Premodern and CEDH, Cube has seen a lot of growth in recent years. And it's not just the quantity of cubes that has been increasing, it's also just the diversity of what Cube can be. Anthony, I know this is something that you are very interested in. Can you just talk a bit about the breadth and depth of what this format looks like today? 
Yeah, I mean, starting just with it's a custom draft format, There's that's really just a very open-ended prompt, and people do all kinds of different things with that. Uh, people use it to sort of recapture the spirit of old standard formats that they loved, of old constructed formats, or even of limited formats. Uh, they just want to go back to Theros and just draft that again and again. And beyond that, people just love individual themes. They want to build a whole environment around proliferator, or around madness, or all kinds of other mechanics like that. Um, so one of the projects I've been very fortunate to work on is the cube map, uh, where we actually took, fortunately, uh, Gwen was able to provide us the list of cubes on Cube Cobra, which is, when we started, it was something around 40,000 lists. I think it's up to, what, 100,000 or something tremendous now. Uh, and my co-conspirator at Lucky Paper Jet has this background in data science, and he was interested in sort of taking all this data and actually trying to visualize that diversity and show us what it looks like. And I was able to sort of connect those dots and with a little bit Connect of web dots. development, nice. uh, I see what you did there. make that something that was actually interactive and visible on the web. So uh, that's how we created the cube map. And you can actually zoom in on this map and see uh, in this sort of algorithmically organized set of every single cube that's on Cube Cobra organized based on the cards they share, which as much as possible sort of groups things that have similar cards together. Uh, you can see all these little islands of here's the, the Theros island, here's the Innistrad island with little separate uh, archipelagos and peninsulas for things that are just, you know, the spooky themes or individual sets that are just, you know, set cubes. And then all kinds of things that you can't really name because there are patterns in the way that people are interested in building things that are just not as obviously label labelable as a set or a particular mechanic. And then we've also got individual islands like your degenerate microcube has spawned a whole bunch of uh, clones and you know people that are exploring similar space. So there's, there's a, a little isthmus island. of just cubes where all the cards are literative. Just to give you a sense <laughs> the of, uh, of how isthmus. broad this, this world actually is. And then right in the center is my cube, where uh, I'm happy to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I could talk at length about sort of the, the mechanics of how the algorithm actually works. I think that might be a little bit more than we want to get into here. But suffice it to say, it's really fun to sort of get into the cube map and explore it. And if you are interested in sort of starting your own cube and have some idea of themes and things like that, uh, it's a great way just to explore what's out there and find what other people are doing in a similar space. I did ask each of our panelists to select one cube that they thought was unique and interesting they wanted to talk about to, again, sort of highlight the diversity of what cube can be. So uh, first up here, once this slide loads, I believe we're going to be looking at the old border foil cube, yep. which, Justin, was your selection. Talk about this cube. What do you love about this cube? Uh, everything. <laughs> but to expand a little bit further, because I'm on a panel, um, so the old border foil cube is a cube designed by Jeff Green. And Jeff, I, I had a chance to meet him and talk with him a lot at KubeCon last year. And he designed this cube uh, during COVID. And I think that I would say there's probably not a greater time in cube history that more cubes have been designed than, than, than during uh, you know, the, the depths of 20 and 2021. Uh, when can make a graph of it? <laughs> probably so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Jeff's cube is made up of cards that are only able to be found in the traditional, original foil styling. The original border for, well, the almost original border for Magic uh, and the first foiling style for Magic. So every card in this cube, outside of a very, very small amount, I believe there's some dual lands that are able to be foiled in that old style is. So that means that for the most part, this cube takes place from Urza's legacy to Scourge. Scourge. <laughs> <laughs> One of those. Uh, now, I'll put an asterisk on that because obviously when this cube was starting to be designed, that was it. But since then, some other cards have been released in that old border and foil, which is was interesting to Jeff because that was not an expectation when building this cube. Uh, the reason that I love this cube is it is a one, first of all, from a play standpoint, a fantastic environment. Um, the power level of this cube is just very surprisingly tight, uh, and it doesn't have these these gigantic power outliers, which you know. There's so many cards printed now, but that uh, I think that is more more common now than it was during during this time. And that doesn't mean they're not powerful cards at all. There's plenty of powerful cards, especially you know uh, there's there's cards from Urza block and you know not Marcadian Mass block and all the other blocks. Uh, but this cube reminds me of my childhood and everything that I love about Magic and that I learned to love about Magic. Um, 
And it's actually, it was just really, really special for me. I, I'm sure, I, Jeff would probably be okay with me sharing this. When he and I were talking about the cube and he was telling me how he, um, how he was starting to build this cube, I'm actually almost gonna start crying because we were all, that was the story. We, um, we literally were on the verge of tears like discussing how he's putting this cube and how meaningful it was for him to put this together because of the time in his life that he was having right now and wanted to build something that was special to him. And how everyone responded at KubeCon, this was a very popular cube, um, and it was just so special that everyone just shared in that joy. And I told him how special it was to me that this even existed. Um, and it's really, it's really, I mean, truly amazing to hold and look at. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and th that, to me, is being a, you know, that I, I talked about that first pack of cube that I ever opened. This reminds me of that to the maximum degree, which is why this is the cube that I picked. Yeah. I mean, nostalgia is such a powerful part of magic, and it's such a powerful part of cube, because there isn't really another format where you can say, like, I love the spirit of, you know, playing modern at this particular year, or I love this memory of, I opened this one card in the first draft that I 3 0 or any number of all the many magic experiences that we have. It's hard to recreate those in, you know, the latest constructed format, the latest yeah. limited format, but cube is just this opportunity where we really can recapture whatever that experience was. And when you find somebody else that's trying to recapture that same kind of experience, that's really a, an incredible way to make a connection with someone. Mm -hmm. I'm going to flex my moderator role and say we should speed up a little bit talking about why we like these cubes. Justin, hard act to follow. Anthony, you chose Petty Nobility, designed by John Terrell of Cultic Cube. What do you love about this cube? So I'm always just a champion of low-powered cubes. I just love, I got a chance to play this cube at KubeCon, and I think that like everything that John makes, it just has this wonderful sort of consistency and aesthetic and beauty and actually getting to play with it. It was just like playing a delightful limited set where you get to play with all these, uh, you know, interesting uncommons that don't quite make the cut in your commander deck from that you used to play years ago and things like that. So to me, this was just a really a, a, a wonderful cube to play and I'd love to highlight more of these designs that really just focus on creating a great, great play experience. And if you ever doubt that designing a cube truly is an artistic creative act, just go look at the names of John's cubes and read the descriptions <laughs> yeah. of them, and uh, you'll see that this is a very creative thing to actually make your own cube. I wanted to throw my own here. Uh, I wanted to talk about a maze fey cube. This is designed by Magic, which is a fun name to say. Uh, this is a great example, I think, of a cube that is flavor forward. So uh, this cube is all about fantasy and the like world of fairies and what comes with that and the, the themes that kind of emerge from there. And uh, I want to give a special shout out to Mae for uh, her cube updates are some of the most uh, beautiful and eloquent cube updates. You know, if you, if you start digging around cube cover, you can find these blogs where people are pouring their heart and soul into their little cube environment that, you know, maybe not many people are even reading, but they're out there, you know, doing all this work to make these great environments for us. So uh, the Fey Cube is, I think, a great example of a, uh, a, a flavor first cube. In the same way that you chose a flavor first cube, I chose a mechanics first cube. This is Reading Rainbow. It's designed by mutual friend Daniel Wheatley. And um, Daniel really loves gold cards. He's a huge fan of Commander and um, chose a cube where every player starts the game with a pillar of the Perun's in play. And that card allows you to cast gold cards. And it's a rainbow land, but only if you're playing gold. In this cube, all the cards are gold. So this all is of a rainbow them. land all, all for your them. entire all of deck <laughs> that you start with in play. So I love that this, number one, breaks a fundamental rule of magic in a really elegant way that creates a lot of interesting gameplay. And I love that Daniel was able to capture what he loved most about the game of magic. Yeah, no hybrid cards, only color artifacts. If you're like, Daniel, what about this card? What about a dual land, Daniel? No, no, no. Dual lands do not have a gold border. If it's not a gold card, it will be nowhere near my gold cube. Yep. I mean, this cube is really interesting because it is such a simple change. Everybody starts with this one extra game piece, and it is mind-bending to try and get your head around how you actually construct your deck in this. And that's something else that I just love about this format is you can really try and, again, uh, be a spike about it and try and solve these complicated novel puzzles. And the challenges that you can face in some of these interesting environments people are coming up with uh, is just incredible. Speaking of which, Finally, the antithesis to the all gold cube. Uh, Gwen, you want to talk about the Devoid cube, which is here this weekend if you uh, want to play it. Yeah, the, the Devoid cube, uh, it's, de it's designed by Dan Schneider. Um, it asks the question, what if instead of unlimited basics, you only have access to wastes? 
and every card is colorless. Um, there are some, like as you can see, some some lands that produce colored mana, which creates a really interesting um, environment where there are some cards with like colored activation abilities or like literally devoid, you know, cards with devoid that require colored mana. And if you want to play those, you have to actually draft those cards. And it's just look one of the most unique environments I've ever played. Uh, and you can choose to just play colorless. You can go big. You can go small. It, it, like you really can can just like do anything uh, you want, and it's it's really really unique. I have a very fond memory of this cube from CubeCon. Oh, no. <laughs> One of the great things about Cube is you get to play with cards that otherwise you just can't play with. For example, Chaos Orb, uh, you know, the card that is a dexterity part where you flip the card onto the table and destroy any cards it's touching. So where you place your cards on the table all of a sudden matters. And I got to just brag a little bit. I did totally own Gwen uh, <laughs> once with a Chaos Orb in our matches at CubeCon. And for all subsequent games, you asked to judge how far apart you were <laughs> legally allowed to put your permanents in play and then distribute them as far as you could so I couldn't possibly two for one you with my Chaos Orb. I mean, which, talk about recapturing the nostalgia of a certain period of old magic. This was really something you can't, you can't see every day. Yeah, yeah. Andy didn't just two for one. He three for one, me destroying two of my lands and yeah. my only It destroys lands, play. too. It's great. It's and <laughs> in that picture, I, I, I had a Mystic Forge, which is really important, also really good in this environment because every card's colorless and you can play any card off the top. And what I did is I, I tucked it right underneath the little sign that held our table number just so it would be harder to, to drop a Chaos <laughs> Which you also verified was okay with the judge who thought oh, yeah. about it for a minute and was like, <laughs> you know, we're going to figure it out on Nothing the in the rules that say you can't put a little sign on your Mystic Forge. <laughs> So uh, we're going to have a little bit of time for questions. So if somebody does have a question, I'll ask you to kind of like line up uh, now as we cover this last question here, and we'll take as many as we can in order. Um, I want to end here asking each of our panelists, you know, in an era where casual magic, casual formats really are ascendant, with, of course, Commander being the vanguard, what does Cube offer to players that they just can't get from any other kind of magic? I mean, to me, when you frame it that way, it's very obvious. I feel like I love Commander because you get to be really creative. You get to put all your favorite cards in a very flavorful way into a deck. But you do have to get everybody to sort of be on the same page about mm -hmm. playing at a power level that's appropriate and balanced. And I love that Cube just lets you do that same thing, but you don't have to have that sort of balance issue. You just say, like, here's the cards. Let's all throw ourselves at it and try and do the best. Uh, and that just makes it such a wonderful synthesis of my favorite things about, the fo about magic in general. I should have gone first. That's, I agree. That's, that's literally my favorite thing about Cube, being say that this is exactly the specific environment we're going to play. There's not going to be these you know, power outliers where we have to have a conversation ahead of time. Just roll exactly, up, yeah. make those packs, pass them out. My favorite thing is that a Cube environment is kind of co-created. I mean, I choose the cards for my Cube, and I put them in the list. But then there are seven other brains, seven other minds that are looking at the pack, choosing what they love about Magic and what they want to play. And that creates a metagame. And that metagame isn't something that exists in any other format in the same way, because it's created by me and my friends. And that's really wonderful. What I love about Cube is that I think of it just like a really big board game. And it can be any type of game that you want it to be. And all you need is people to show up, you have the cube, and you can just play a really great game. Yeah. One of the interesting things I've learned from uh, you know working in the cube space is uh, there's actually a lot of people that they love designing a cube that they may almost never play. And the, uh, the creative experience of just designing something new is, uh, is what draws them to the format, even if they don't get to draft it that often. We're going to move into uh, Q&As. Uh, we have about five minutes, maybe a couple minutes more. So uh, I guess we'll start with that first question there. Hey folks, my name is Zach, and I'm an avid cube player, but I've never really gotten into the design space. How would you recommend someone build their very first cube? Their very first cube? Well, um, I would recommend that you find all the cards you like out of your collection. Maybe you can even ask your friends for their favorite cards that they don't have a home for, that are maybe banned in Commander, but um, you know they want to find a home for it. Take those cards, put them in a shoebox, Sleeve up the cards, maybe, if you want, and start drafting. And as you do that, you'll notice, oh, you know what this cube really needs? You know, it needs this card. It needs a cur ape. All my cubes need a cur ape, personally. Um, and that's just, you know, start drafting. That's my advice. 
Yeah, I think the really critical thing is it's very easy to make changes to a cube. It's very hard to make decisions about a cube when you have no play experience. Yeah. So even if you start with something very, very rough, you know, just these are the 360 of my favorite cards, play it, and then you'll be like, oh yeah, you know, this color is way overpowered, this interaction just really wasn't fun. Uh, then actually making informed decisions based on play experience is so much easier than just theory crafting in a vacuum. I do want to add that I think a lot of people are afraid they're going to mess up their first cube. Like, what if I do it bad? What if the balance is off? And I think the anything you can do to get over that fear and just make it, because draft is fun, playing magic is fun. Draft is pretty self-balancing, right? Like, your players have autonomy to take the good cards and not take the bad ones. So uh, just getting over that like hurdle of feeling like you can't do it to having something you can draft uh, is the best way to get started, I think. Thank you for your question. Thank you, guys. Second question here. Hello, this is uh, I'm Max, uh, and my question is: I know Anthony, you mentioned something about wanting to play cube to learn more about being a magic player and improve your skill. Are there any things that you, or and this is not specific to you, but that you think it has made you a better magic player or learned about the game, like how game how it works, uh, by either playing or drafting cube or designing cube? Uh, I might just say I've learned a lot about my limitations as a player from playing a lot of cube. I mean, something that's, that's challenging and, and also really rewarding is just that we play a lot of different cubes, you know, from the old gold cube to the devoid cube, where you just have to really, really like, it's, it's exhausting. There's just so many new cards and recontextualizations, uh, but it's also really fun and rewarding. Um, but it's, it is difficult to pin down, like, what are those exact level ups? Maybe others can speak to those. Yeah, I think a really humbling experience for me was playing some cubes at KubeCon against incredible players and just yeah. realizing like how big of a difference there really is between you know the average <laughs> player and, and some of these pro players and just the way that they approach a cube is just so different and I feel like I learned a lot just just you know losing against them. <laughs> and I, I know I'm a very competitive player and I don't have the patience to play any other format competitively. Like if I really wanted to get good at retail limited I would download Arena, and I would grind as many drafts as I could in all my spare time and get as much practice in as I could. And I just don't have, I don't have the time or patience for that. I don't love playing digitally. So Cube is the one format where you know we sit down, and it's a format that nobody solved. Nobody really knows what's best. It's kind of like you know sitting down for the first draft of a new set where no one really knows what's going on. You're trying to figure it out on the fly. And you can truly like bring your most competitive self to that format without feeling like you're doing yourself a disservice by not having practiced or read up on the meta or listened to podcasts about it or whatever. Yeah, I mean, you really get to spend a lot of time on that steep part of the learning curve because you are approaching a lot of new environments. And that's, I think, for a lot of us, where we really enjoy being is where you're in those first couple drafts and you feel that you're learning very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. So this is a broad question for everybody. When you're building your cube deck, do you have to have rares and mythics in it, or can you just do common and uncommon? Great yeah. question. Absolutely not. Uh, cube uh, can truly, and when we say it can be whatever you know you want it to be, uh, some of the most fun cubes that I've drafted are do not have rares and mythics. Common and uncommon cubes, uh, pauper and peasant cubes is commonly what they're called, are very, very fun. Uh, I, I mean, that's just uh, really that's the selling point, right, for Cube, before Magic at all. But um, there, especially now, there are so many good ways to create archetypes within a Cube that do not require rares or mythics at all to still have an excellent experience. So. Yeah, I think we've been seeing even increasing sort of willingness to blur the lines. I think earlier in cube designs, ideas of this is my common only or my uncommon and common only cubes were a thing. Now we see more and more people just, you know, interested in this theme and it's going to be mostly commons and commons. But there's a couple rares that are really great fits. Let's throw those in. Uh, and sort of that willingness to just try what works has is, is really been great to see in the community. One of my favorite cubes that I've drafted recently is a common and uncommon cube with no rares or mythics except for rare lands. Mm -hmm. The mana fixing is rare, no, no other cards a rare mythic. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Sorry to anybody we're not going to get to, but uh, last question here. Make it a good one. No pressure. Hi, uh, I'm Mark. Um, my question for you is, is there, um, so you know about hidden Mickeys, right? Or like an artist signature. What is um, a signature that you have in your cubes? Or like a card or card archetype that you absolutely must have when you're designing a cube? Yeah, so just to restate it, the question was, what are like your personal 
signatures that you bring to the own cubes you design? Is there a certain card? I know, uh, Parker, you mentioned you've got to put curd ape in every cube. What are each of your signatures? This is a great question to end on. Thank you. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have a specific card. I have always put a, a, just a ton of lands in my cube. Like, my cube's like, like no less than 15%, sometimes up 20% lands. And I think that's actually more, it's, that's actually becoming more common now, but I've done that for 15 years since I've made a cube. So that's kind of like my signature. And I love triomes. Andy hates them. It's true. One thing I have in my main cube is about half of it is done. It's, I have like full art altars. And that's something that I, I go really out of my way to just make it look like different because everything is altered. Mm. Sapperlings. Sapperlings. <laughs> and with that, our panel is over <laughs> on that bombshell. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I do want to mention that you can find all of our uh, panelists here on social media. Justin, especially, is making a lot of videos, streaming. He's always out there making great content, so make sure to check him out. And uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.